Well, it's a pleasure to come and uh, join you all this morning. When I was in the state legislature in Oregon, I was immersed in energy issues. So Oregon uh, has a conservation ethic and a renewable ethic going back to bills that were passed 30 years ago. Bills uh, such as uh, making the beaches, public beaches throughout our state, such as uh, having the first uh, recycling bill in the nation, uh, and the third, a major land use bill where all of Oregon is zoned with essentially growth boundaries around every city to uh, be able to create more sustainable, livable metropolitan areas while protecting farmland and forest land. Those are some of the ancestors of the energy and the environment conversation we continue to have in Oregon. And certainly, uh, Part of the reason and driver in Oregon now is that we also see it as economic opportunity. An opportunity to create products uh, that we can sell outside of the state and hopefully outside of the United States. An opportunity to create our own power and thereby keep our energy dollars inside the boundaries of our economy rather than seeing them exported. So that's a little bit of the background with which I brought to, to DC and uh, it is a, it's a pleasure to be able to come and be part of a national and really an international conversation about energy and the environment. And for so long, and I think the, the skit that you were referring to captures it, it well, for so long we in America have recognized the downside of our addiction to oil through many, many presidencies. Uh, we have recognized and that the fact that shipping dollars overseas is not, does not strengthen our economy. When I was campaigning for the Senate, because of the spike in oil prices, that was about $2 billion a day. Now it's about a $1 billion a day. A $1 billion a day shipped overseas, which is very good for the economies abroad selling the oil, but very bad for the United States in terms of those dollars leaving our economy, not continuing to circulate through our retail stores and through our families and creating jobs here. Meanwhile, in terms of, of national security, it becomes an imperative when your energy economy is dependent upon resources ranging around the world to protect access to those resources. And that's a very high national security cost. Uh, various uh, experts have estimated it and translated it into dollars per gallon. I think the highest estimate I've ever seen is equivalent of $5 per gallon for a gallon of gas in terms of security apparatus necessary to sustain the, the flow of oil. And indeed, there's another national security angle in which the petrodollars uh, find their, their way into the hands of, of, of terrorist organizations. As uh, some uh, uh, national security experts have noted, that in the wars we're fighting now, we are funding both sides, which is something to make us stop and think about the national security implications of our energy policy. So since there's been so much conversation about the challenges of our oil addiction, why not have a plan to address it? Part of the challenge we have in a democracy is we, we change presidents and teams every four years. How do you sustain a plan that will take a couple decades to implement? In that regard, the, the plan that uh, I've laid out with my uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Tom Udall and, and Tom Carper and Michael Bennett, is to create a National Energy Security Council that would be in the office of the president and that would have the role of continuing to bring to bear ideas and proposed legislation, proposed regulations, proposed policy initiatives that would keep us on the course to ending our dependence on, on foreign oil. Now the estimates, when we look two decades down the road, the estimates of how much oil would be importing from overseas, so this is not including Canada and potentially Mexico, although Mexico is considered <coughs> probably not to be an exporter two decades from now. Uh, that's about in the range of 6 million barrels per day, 6 to 7 million barrels per day. Therefore, we need a plan to be able to reduce our consumption by at least that much and hopefully a significant amount, amount more. And the plan that we've put together calls for reductions equivalent to 8.3 million barrels per day. And that's just the number that flowed out of the, the best estimates of the various policies that we can bring to bear. And one of those policies is to change the consumption in motor vehicles. 
We all recognize that that is a, the biggest consumer of, of petroleum. We are right now <coughs> on the verge of a tremendous op market opportunity. And that opportunity, first we have hybrids we've become well familiar with. We have plug-in hybrids that are about to uh, become part of the, the market. We have the, the uh, strategy, the technological strategy uh, characterized by the Chevrolet Volt, which is to have an electric car with a, a backup motorized uh, engine that can recharge the batteries of the electric car mm -hmm. if you find yourself out of range, if you will, so you're not, you're not stranded. We have the Nissan uh, Volt, uh, excuse me, uh, Leaf, which will be uh, uh, arriving uh, in short order. And uh, some of you, has anybody been following the uh, Tour de France? You've seen the Nissan <laughs> Leaf ads with Lance Armstrong saying, you know, for his entire lifetime, he's been cycling behind uh, cars or trucks, and the, everything they always had in common was an exhaust, exhaust pipe sitting right in front of him. And finally, he has the opportunity to, to cycle behind uh, cars that, uh, that don't. And so they're, they're putting significant marketing uh, emphasis or uh, uh, weight into uh, the Nissan Leaf. The process of pursuing plug-in cars gives us an opportunity to save the equivalent of 3.2 billion barrels per day. So that's the single biggest factor. To pursue that, Senator Lamar Alexander, Republican from Tennessee, Senator Byron Dorgan, Democrat from North Dakota, and myself, put together an electric vehicle bill that will create electric vehicle deployment communities to try to solve the problem of the chicken and the egg, in which you need plug-in infrastructure along with the deployment of plug-in cars until it kind of has the significant market share to take off. And we hope that what we will learn from those deployment communities, and the, the emphasis in the bill is that they, those communities would all be very, have different sets of characteristics, would enable us to have the best possible strategies for the nation in terms of encouraging this, this transition. A second uh, piece is the efficient movement of, of freight. We have out in uh, Oregon a, a nonprofit named the Cascade Sierra. And it is a partner to the trucking industry, and it brings together all the latest technological opportunities to make trucks more efficient, from automatic tire inflation uh, to small portable generators that enable trucks to power up their electronics without running their diesel engine, uh, and to uh, uh, plug-in uh, stations where uh, uh, truckers stop, uh, to uh, airfoil technology. And uh, all of that, when you save a, a mile or two or three per gallon, adds up to a tremendous amount uh, of savings. We can also proceed to encourage a shift of a significant share, 10% of the freight that would otherwise be carried on trucks onto barges and rail. Some of you may have heard the statistic, but I think it's a stunning statistic. And it is how far can a single gallon a fuel propel a ton of freight on rail. Anybody know the answer to that? Right down here, our expert panel. Anybody, any, anyone else want to mention that? Four thirty-six. Four thirty-six. I hear down there, and uh, you're referring to four hundred thirty-six meters, four hundred thirty-six miles. Miles. Well over four hundred. And I don't know if that's the latest number. I've seen various numbers, 436, 472, but over 400 miles with a single gallon. In the, so, so moving freight by rail and by barge is enormously efficient. But having strategies that encourage them that, in addition to making freight on the roads more efficient, can save 2 million barrels of oil uh, per day. The third strategy is to have smarter metropolitan transportation options. And have any of you folks been out to Portland, Oregon? A uh, fair number. Okay, well, I tell you, we have uh, been experimenting in Portland, and we have a, a light rail system. Uh, we have now created a, a streetcar system uh, that is growing, and uh, there are uh, communities around the country that are looking at the possibility of adding streetcars. Uh, the advantage is they operate like a bus line, but they are most both more energy efficient. And because they are permanent infrastructure, they really encourage development along the, the lines. <coughs> and so they're very interesting economic development op opportunity. In Eugene, Oregon, we have uh, rapid transit buses. 
Uh, many communities are experience, uh, experimenting with uh, uh, moving to uh, uh, more electrification of, of buses or uh, uh, natural gas, uh, which produce less carbon dioxide per amount of energy expended, uh, providing simply the opportunity for uh, bicycle paths and uh, other mechanisms in the metropolitan area. All of these things can combine. A new term has been coined in, in Oregon to try to capture that whole set of, of, of opportunities, called, and the term is the intertwine. And so uh, I don't know that it's spread beyond Oregon yet, but if you hear something about the intertwine, that's the, a, a <coughs> complex of alternatives for transportation that get people off the, off the roads. This is uh, the third uh, uh, largest potential strategy, upwards of uh, 1.75 million barrels per day savings. Alternative fuels. It isn't all about, if you will, the, the process of being more efficient. It also includes substitution. And natural gas and advanced biofuels create a substitution opportunity that keeps dollars here in America. And we've had a tremendous growth <coughs> through new drilling technologies in the availability of natural gas. So that is a, a significant uh, possibility. You know, since I was a uh, uh, knee high to a grasshopper, we've had natural gas, compressed natural gas being used on, on forklifts. Uh, we have uh, certainly some bus transportation systems that, that employ it, but it could be used in a, in a much wider way for medium and, and heavy duty uh, vehicles. Uh, certainly uh, in Oregon, we're very interested in uh, cellulosic ethanol. We have one of the first commercial plants going in that converts poplar trees into fuel in Boardman, Oregon. Now, if that's successful, it will pave the path for other opportunities that will include our forests, which we have millions of acres of second growth forests that need to be thin and can provide a lot of biomass that can, can be converted in this, in this fashion. And then uh, finally, uh, homes and buildings. And this is a small factor because not a lot of homes and buildings are heated with heating fuel, heating oil. But for those that are, it makes sense to pay attention and increase the energy efficiency of their homes because there's savings of about 200,000 barrels a day. Now, uh, our, uh, our panel will have uh, a lot more details and a lot more information, uh, but this is kind of the, the bones of a strategy. And what's really lacking is not the technology. What's lacking is the political will. There are economic interests that certainly would like to see us continue our dependence on overseas oil. But if we think about our responsibility as a governing community, our responsibility is to think about how to position the United States strategically and how to take on not only the financial issues, national security issues, but also our stewardship of the environment. And energy planning is deeply connected to all three of those. And if we think in terms of strategic positioning and we're looking down the road, we're looking at China, which is going to have a vast increase in its demand uh, for oil, other growing economies. We can only anticipate that the cost of fuel is going to go up. We hit uh, a peak of about $4 per gallon out in Oregon, and uh, now we're down a little below $3. But I have no doubt that in five years or 10 years, it could be six or seven or eight. Better for us to shift from that overseas <coughs> oil to energy created, manufactured right here in America. And when we shift to electricity, we shift and have the opportunity to shift to indeed forms of renewable energy, wind, wave, geothermal, solar, and so forth. So that's the outlines. Thank you for the opportunity to come and give an introduction to it. And thank you to all the panelists for coming with their expertise to help drive the, the energy conversation forward. Thank you.